Hey, good morning, Christine. Welcome, welcome. Good to see you. I hope you're uh, feeling better after your bout with a lot of sickness up in Canada there. And happy almost New Year. Happy almost New Year. Just about ready. And good morning to Mikey uh, Potts as well. And to uh, Marie Marie Harrison. Welcome to you folks. Good to have you here. Happy, uh, happy almost new year to everybody that's uh, a part of the live stream so far. And hope you have some great resolutions set up for yourself. Just had to cut some denim as well. It's been a really busy week, a very busy week. I'm not sure about by you, but transitioning from uh, the holidays, Christmas and that, and then going right into the new year. Boy, oh boy, it's just a blur, isn't it? It's just a blur. How is my uh, how is my audio quality today? I'm adding uh, I'm adding a new extension USB cable to give me more reach with the camera. That's why you're able to see this angle of the machine today. My old cord would not have reached this far, so I'm just curious with this uh, extension USB cord that I've added. Uh, is there any distortion? Are you able to hear me okay as far as audio quality? I'm just going to look at the chat real quick and see if uh, if I'm coming through clearly. Hopefully, I am. Okay, good. Hey, good morning to Susie, too. Good morning to Susie. Good to hear the audio quality is working well. And this extension cord gives me probably another three feet of reach. And it came by way of uh, Madeline uh, from Naples, Florida. She saw me kind of struggling with the camera and trying to get around the edges of the machine and everything. And she took mercy on me and probably through Amazon uh, ordered this extension cord and boy is it a it is a godsend as far as not having to be concerned that I'm going to unplug the, the camera or something like that. Gonna take a quick peek at something. Well, how many of you have heard of Fister and Rossman before? I know on Facebook when I posted these uh, progress pictures, and again, if you're not aware of it, what I do before I do a live stream like this is I will post sometimes hundreds of progress photos of the steps that I've taken a particular machine through. And uh, there are some really, really neat shots of this machine on Facebook. It even caught my friend out in Oregon uh, that runs the sewing business, a sewing repair business. It's called Stagecoach something or other. Real nice fella. And uh, he had never seen one of these before either and was really curious about the hand crank design setup and everything like that. So 
Uh, but I'm just curious if, if this was kind of a surprise machine for a lot of you in seeing this machine pop up, first of all, on Facebook and now pop up on YouTube. And uh, as I shared on Facebook, Fister and Rossman, while it's fairly unknown compared to, say, a name like uh, Foff, uh, which is almost a household name, this at one time until around 1902 was the largest manufacturer of sewing machines in Europe, anywhere in Europe. They made more sewing machines than anyone. And this particular one is really a machine that came into existence after they kind of handed off the reins to a London-based company. And the reason we know that is the way it's badge marked. But first of all, I'm going to take off this beautiful Bentwood cover. If you saw in the Facebook shots, I showed a comparison of the size of this Bentwood cover case compared to a standard Singer one. This just dwarfs, it literally dwarfs a standard Bentwood case that, saying a, say, a Singer 66 would come in. It's just a huge case, not the most practical case to be carrying around everywhere, but it's a beautiful, beautiful way to house the machine and also to uh, sew with the machine as well. So with, without further ado, thankfully, I don't have to unlock it with this really cool skeleton key. Hopefully you can see that. I'm just going to show it to you a little bit closer up. I love skeleton keys. I don't know if anyone else is fascinated by traditional type skeleton keys. And this is only a single little uh, point on here. Some of the skeleton keys are incredibly ornate. But you can see they also have it uh, badge marked on the outside of this Bentwood cover as well. Fister and Rossman. Again, a company, does anyone know where this company was founded and approximately what year? If anyone knows the year that Fister and Rossman was founded and where they were founded, go ahead and share that in the chat. And I'll go ahead and take a look and see what you typed as a kind of a fellow fact checker and just make sure that it's good to go. But you can see even the, the decorative work here on the side of the machine. This is where you would insert that key to open up this case. And you can see the case as well. I think you can see that in the shot. Uh, the case as well is badge marked with uh, Quitman, Quitman, and then London, Quitman, London. And Quitman, London is who would have taken over uh, Fister and Rossman uh, after the World War, uh, right around in the 1940s. So a lot of the machine is going to have that badge mark of this London-based company. That's why I put the title of this, you know, basically from Berlin to London is how this company evolved. So let me take a real quick look at the chat and just see what you guys came with. And we'll kind of go from there. Hey, welcome to Emma as well. And Emma is, uh, as she shared, she's at work. She works in a hospital as a pharmacist. So uh, if she's ever part of a live stream and you have any general questions about pharmaceutical stuff, she's very knowledgeable, very, very knowledgeable in that field. And I don't want to put her on the spot because I know she doesn't want to divvy out medical advice, but it's always great to know the, the backgrounds that our cow country family has. We have so many talented people that are part of our family. And Christine said, uh, Christine said, Germany, 1864, Germany, 1864. Any other uh, guesses on that? Let's see. And Susie is saying 1864 as well. Well, you ladies are both correct. And more specifically than Germany, Fister and Rossman have roots that go back to Berlin. That's where they started the company, is in the beautiful city of Berlin. And it was around 1864 and they had not been on the scene that long before they drew the attention 
of the Singer Sewing Machine Company. Does anyone know how Fister and Rossman and Singer ended up getting acquainted? Does anyone know the answer to that, how they got acquainted? Just curious. I'm going to move the camera back, and I'm going to go ahead and take this cover off now. Got to find a place to put this huge cover away. Oh, my goodness. See the size of that thing. Oh, my gosh. It's just, it's a mammoth cover. Just mammoth. All right. Let's set this camera right over here. Right now. So how did Fister and um, how did Fister and Rossman and Singer Sewing Machine get acquainted? Susie put down a lawsuit. That sounds pretty ridiculous, doesn't it? To meet another company through a lawsuit? Well, she's absolutely correct. Singer Sewing Machine Company alleged that. Fister and Rossman had copied the design of one of their machines. Does anyone know what machine Singer claimed that Fister and Rossman had copied design features of? Anyone know what machine that was that Singer Singer rolled out a machine? And uh, it was right around 1883. 1883 is when Singer and Fister and Rossman got acquainted through a lawsuit, as Susie said. Does anyone know what machine Singer alleged that Fister and Rossman had copied design features from? Any guesses? Well, if there's no guesses, if there's no guesses, I don't see any guesses yet. What what Singer alleged, and it wasn't specifically of this machine, although when you look at the bottom of this machine, the design of this machine, as far as the mechanics, does parallel a machine very closely that I recently showed on this channel that was shipped all the way back to Virginia. The, the, the state of Virginia, but that machine that I shipped back to Virginia, and that is the model I'm talking about that Singer said that Fister and Rossman had copied design features of. That particular machine is also a hand crank. That particular machine also very interestingly that I just shipped back to the great state of Virginia. That machine also started in London, England, or I should say it started in England at Alex Askaroff's workshop. Alex Askaroff sold this machine to Trish. Trish had the bottom drop out on the machine, damaged the machine very badly. And when she reached out to Alex Askaroff and saying, can you help me? I'll pay you anything. I'll pay you to ship it all the way back to England. Alex said, go to Scott. He's the guy. So even internationally, now I'm getting the reputation for give me the hardest, most difficult cases, and I will take care of it. It's kind of like this machine right here that when this was brought into the workshop by Marcy, oh, my goodness, gravy. I think I'm a fairly strong guy, and usually if a machine is frozen, I can at least get a little bit of movement out of the balance wheel. I could not budge the balance wheel on this Fister and Rossman. And it's because I learned that it had been stored in a location where the entire inner core of the machine was just riddled with rust. It was cemented with rust. And this machine would not budge. That's no longer the case, thankfully. Thankfully, that's no longer the case. Christine is brilliant. Christine is brilliant out of Canada. Like, most everyone in this classroom, you guys are so smart. You always amaze me. And Christine is exactly right. The 12K 
It was also called the New Family Machine by Singer. The New Family Machine by Singer, the 12K, is in fact the machine model that Singer said, shame on you, Fister and Rossman. Shame on you. Shame, 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 shame. You guys have copied our design. And they took them to court over that. You know, you can sue somebody for anything, but they did. You know, as I look at this machine and I look at the mechanics again on the bottom in particular, it does have some of the design features that that 12K did that certainly did precede the models that would have been rolled out uh, by Fister and Rossman that would have been similar. So there you go. All right, let's get a little bit closer to this machine. And also for my friend that runs a sewing machine restoration business out in Oregon, it's called Stagecoach something. I, I never remember his full name. It's, it's, a, it's a very cool company, it sounds like. He was really, really intrigued by this hand crank because this hand crank is not like other hand cranks that you've seen. This is what you would typically see in a hand crank, something like this. And this is an aftermarket one. But typically, it's going to marry up with a spoked wheel machine. This is going to go inside of the opening of one of the spokes. And then as you turn it, it's going to move that balance wheel by turning that spoked wheel. And you can see right away that this is a solid balance wheel. So this type of a hand crank would not work on a machine like this because it doesn't have the spoked wheel. Well, how does this one work then? And this is something that Fister and Rossman came up with that Singer cannot claim that they stole. As far as an idea, it was very a very unique idea. What they did, and I'll get real close to the machine so you can see it. What they did is they took a hand crank and coming off of the hand crank, instead of something like this, they came with a, a straight type of shaft that goes into an opening that is made in the balance wheel. It slides in there, and that's what gives it positive traction. And as you crank it, it's going to move the entire balance wheel, and it's going to be in that fixed position there. You can actually see it sticking through the other side right about there. So this is a real interesting way to give locomotion to a machine that you typically wouldn't see when it's a hand crank. The other thing you'll notice right away is this hand crank right now looks like it's in trouble, doesn't it? How are you going to crank it like this? not going to work very well. Well, what they have is they have a little spring inside of here and a little way to turn this left or right so that once you take it out of the case, you can then extend it like this and there's a spring that pulls it into position like that. There's actually a spring inside of there. And then when you want to put that bentwood cover back on, you just pull this out and rotate it up and it tucks right back into the balance wheel again so that it's out of the way. So really, a, again, a very clever way of allowing you to fit this inside of that case uh, without having to, you know, get the hand crank just in the right position, kind of like on the 12Ks. The 12Ks, you've got to rotate that back just to the right place so it's way down low and kind of towards the bottom and then you can get that cover back on Otherwise, it does obstruct that, that cover from going on on the Singer 12Ks. So I think this is a great improvement. And you can rotate it either way. I can't do it because of the position of the hand crank now. But you can rotate it down. You can rotate it up and tuck it away and get it out of the way. So that's kind of neat. And then also they got this nice little cubby hole right here where you can store all kinds of goodies, kind of like Marcy does right now. She's got these extra um, needles and this oiling can and other attachments for the machine as well. And then you've got this nice little kind of a, a velvet lined uh, cubby hole that you can keep all of your goodies in. I probably would keep some bubble gum and candy in there as well just to have it nice and accessible. 
So again, really thoughtful design and and well made as well. Very, very well made. You can see across the front too, they have a little measuring uh, tape sort of thing that's both in centimeters and inches as well. So if you want to take a piece of fabric real quick and get a quick measurement and cut it, you don't have to necessarily bring out a tape measure or something like that. You've got a tape measure built right into the base of the machine. And then like I was talking about with this particular company trading hands after World War II in the 1940s, you can see that the badge mark on this machine isn't just Fister and Rossman. It's also uh, Quitman out of London. And Quitman out of London is the company that took over and bought all the rights to Fister and Rossman uh, in the mid 1940s. I'd have to look to see specifically what date it is, but they bought all the rights to Fister and Rossman and, and basically took over the company. So this would have been a machine that would have been post-World War II uh, because of the branding mark on it. At that time, it was no longer just Fister and Rossman. It was now Fister and Rossman by way of uh, Quitman out of London. So, and that's the, that's the truth about sewing machine companies is they change hands uh, all the time, don't they? They change hands all the time. Let me set the camera down real quick and I'll just kind of tilt this back. And if we want to tilt this machine back, all we have to do is loosen this little thumb screw right here. And we can tilt our machine back for servicing and maintenance, etc. <laughs> I got a little piece of paper down there. And if you look underneath here, the design of this machine does have some of some of the characteristics uh, of a 12K. If you've seen the bottom of a 12K or you saw the 12K in some of my progress photos. Uh, you're going to see that it does have similar attributes. The difference, of course, is that this is a standard vibrating shuttle machine, and the 12K is a transverse vibrating style shuttle machine. And you saw that machine presented recently that belongs to Trish, and she is loving that machine out in Virginia right now. She is absolutely loving it. And you can see here we've got a, a serial number that's stamped on a plate right underneath the base of the machine. That's where you'll find the serial number, at least on this machine. But as far as looking up a specific date, it's a little bit a little bit of a challenge because, again, this is a company that traded hands and went from being based in Berlin to being based in London. And uh, when records get moved around and or left behind, it's a lot more difficult sometimes to determine the dating on some of the, some of the machines. But I'm going to date this machine right around uh, 1948, in that general time frame, 1948. All right, a quick walk around the machine. Just a quick little walk around the machine. Fairly simple machine, actually. You've got a standard clutch release right over here. Stop action. You just rotate this towards you if you want to wind a bobbin. And to wind a bobbin, Again, this machine is going to come with a long bobbin that you have to insert in between here and there. And you slide this over in order to fit it in there. And then it has a spring in here. So as soon as you let it go, it's going to hold that in there nice and firm. The unique thing about the long bobbins for this Fister and Rossman is instead of just being rounded on the edges, there's actually a hole on the end of the long bobbin that slides into a pin that's in here. So you have to kind of line it up on this pin. And this was something that that uh, Fister and Rossman decided to add because sometimes when you're winding a long bobbin, when you're having it extend out that far, it can come sometimes slip a little bit because all it is is the sheer tension of this holding it in place. So they added a little pin that the long bobbin slides into. Uh, so you have to make sure you orientate the long bobbin correctly when you put it in. And then what you're going to do is there's a little gap point right here. There's a little gap point right here. Matter of fact, I'll try to lift up the camera and show it to you. 
And that's where the thread is going to come up from and then go. What I usually do is I'll, I'll tuck a little part of the thread into this edge right here. And then it kind of holds it in place so you can initiate the, uh, the bobbin winding. And you'll set it up similar to other machines as far as bobbin winding. You come off the top and you go to this thread guide right here. Then you come across to here to this tensioner, kind of come underneath it. This tensioner right here. And you come straight up. And again, you come in between this little slat right here. You can kind of see where I'm sliding my shears in. You come right through that little slat. And then you, you get that long bobbin position and you get that thread going around there. You can go ahead and wind a long bobbin. You just push it down like this to lock it into place. When there's a long bobbin in place, it'll lock in place. Otherwise, it doesn't. And then otherwise, it's pulled away from that balance wheel so it's not creating drag. This is our stitch length right here and our, our reverse as well. So right now, I'm at the largest stitch setting that the machine will give me, which is going to be around four to five stitches per inch. It's not going to be quite as robust of a stitch as, say, uh, some of the Singer counterparts that would have done hand cranks in the same period. This is going to be right around five stitches per inch, all the way down to probably close to uh, 25 stitches per inch. And then if you go all the way up to the top, it kind of locks into position. You can go ahead and sew in reverse with this machine as well. So having that reverse function is a great feature for a machine from the, the 1940s. What is this gadget up here? Well, this gadget right here is if you have a larger spool and you want to feed it horizontally, you can actually use this to slide a spool of thread on. Even a larger oversized thread uh, spool will fit on there as well. One similar to this. I'll show you. Whoops. That was bad. Are you guys still there? The only problem with this longer cord is I just caught it with my leg. Jiminy crickets. Looks like the camera's okay, and I can still see you guys. You can still see me, so I guess I, I didn't destroy it. So a spool similar to this, you would be able to slide over the top of there and slide that into position and feed the thread like that. This is going to be a little bit more difficult because it sticks out too far and it's just the uh, the tension of this little rubber boot that's going to hold it in position. So a smaller thread would, would fit on there much easier than you could put a stopper uh, similar to this one uh, to hold it into position, a stopper like that. All right, let me watch where my feet are going this time so I don't knock the camera over again. The threading of this machine, let's look at the threading real quick. Uh, we come off the top with the thread right here. We then go through the back of this little thread guide here. You can see you kind of slide the thread through it. We then come down to this tensioner from right to left and kind of tuck it into that tensioner, which is going to, again, be designed to give us a little bit of pre-upper tension on that thread as we draw that through there. We then have to draw it through these tension discs of the main upper tension, come around through this take-up spring that you can see right there, that check spring. And then we're going to come through this uh, take-up arm from right to left, down through this thread guide. And then there's going to be another thread guide all the way down here, just above the needle. Right now I've got the needle rotated uh, into this material. Well, you can see right now, there's another thread guide that's right about there. And you have to kind of bring the thread in through there. Now, the flat side of the needle for this machine is going to go to the right. And then you're going to be threading this machine from left to right, from left to right. So hopefully that's helpful also to Marcy, because Marcy wasn't really, really clear on the setup of this machine. Now, inside of here, I'm really getting paranoid about that cord. I'm going to knock the camera over again. Right inside of here, 
if we open this slide plate open, you can see we've got our vibrating shuttle right there. And if I move the balance wheel just slightly, I can kind of get it into position where we can see it there. What I use to, uh, to take it out, if I'm going to adjust uh, tension on it, or if I'm going to uh, wind another long bobbin, is I use a dental tool like this. It makes it generally pretty easy to grab the edge of it and to pluck it out of there. Just kind of get on the edge and just kind of lift it up. And then once you get a hold of it, you just kind of slide her, slide her out of there. <clears throat> now, does everyone know, everyone that's part of the live stream, does everyone know how to thread one of these uh, long shuttles, uh, a vibrating shuttle design like this? Does everyone know how to thread it? Or would you like me to show you how to thread it real quick? I have it threaded right now, but I can unthread it and then rethread it again. Would anyone like to see that process? Go ahead and type it in the live chat. Otherwise, we'll just kind of move forward with this. Okay. Oh, hello to, I'll say hello to a couple more people since I'm looking at the computer real quick. Hello to Susie as well. Uh, not Susie from, not Susie from uh, Minnesota, but the other Susie. We've got lots of Susies. And I don't think I have to say hello to anybody else. So real quick uh, tutorial on loading a long bobbin like this. Let me go ahead and take the long bobbin out so you can kind of see it. So this is the actual shuttle here, um, and uh, it does require maintenance as well. Kind of, I'm always talking about maintenance on things. Let me just show you what I recommend as far as maintaining it real quick. So I'm just going to take some, uh, this is kerosene and machine oil mixed. I'm going to go ahead and swab the inside of this because as this shuttle is doing its job, it's going to be allowing that long bobbin, uh, this barbell style bobbin, as some people refer to them, it's going to allow this barbell style bobbin to be spinning inside of here and dispensing that thread. So you want to periodically take... Um, sewing machine oil and or sewing machine oil mixed with kerosene and swab the inside of that shuttle to get that nice and clean and also to add a little bit of a slick surface to it so that that, uh, that uh, barbell bobbin is going to turn more easily inside. And you can see I've cleaned this many, many times, but already, already you can see uh, the dirt that I'm getting off of there. Thread and other things like that uh, act as magnets to draw a lot of the environmental things to the machine, just like a, an electric motor would. So it's very, very easy for uh, a long shuttle like this to get uh, dirty very, very quickly. So clean it, clean it often, clean it often. I would say uh, about every six to eight hours of sewing, you can pull it out and just kind of swab it. And that'll also allow that thread to be dispensing much more evenly. Now, when you're going to drop a, a long bobbin like this in, you've got to decide which way you're going to orientate, which way you're going to orientate the thread. Are you going to have it coming from behind or are you going to be having it come from the front? On this particular one, the book is going to recommend 
that you have it coming around the backside like this. So as it's turning, it's going to be turning counterclockwise if you're looking down at the top of it in the long shuttle itself. And when you're getting ready to insert it, it's really quite simple. You just drop it inside and then have your, you can see this little slat right here that we're going to have to draw the thread through. You just drop it inside. Give me one second here. There we go. Just drop it inside. And then you're going to draw that thread down to the bottom. You can see there's a little bottom point there. Use your finger to hold it on top so that it's not turning. Draw it down to the bottom. And then you're going to draw this back up so that you've threaded it. And I know I kind of blocked that a little bit, but I basically took it down to the bottom and I drew it back up underneath this little leaf tension spring right here. It goes underneath the edge of that. And that tension spring, this right here, is what's going to control that tension as far as this uh, long shuttle. It's going to help define, matter of fact, let me ask you that question. Does this define, define the lock stitch or does this help define the top stitch, this particular shuttle? Because here's our adjuster for it right here. Here's our screw right here that we adjust. We either turn it clockwise to increase the tension or we turn it counterclockwise to decrease. Just get a small screwdriver and you would insert it right in there and turn it counterclockwise to have less tension, turn it clockwise to have more tension. It's going to basically just press this band down harder against that thread to hold it back and to create that tension factor. I'm going to look at the live chat real quick, see what you guys wrote. Yeah, yeah. Susie is correct again. Uh, it's going to help define the top stitch. So this is going to be pulling down to define the top stitch while this upper tension right here is going to be pulling up to define the lock stitch. They're going to be in a tug of war. They're going to be in a tug of war. Oh, hello to, uh, hello to Sunny as well. Hello to Sunny. Good to see Sunny. Now, what about inserting this now? We've got it threaded, and we're not going to make any tension adjustments on it right now. How do you get this sucker back in there? Well, you go with the point first, and then you just slowly lower it into this cradle. This cradle is going to be holding it in the sewing process. So I'm going to go ahead and go with the point first. Let me move this on the other side. You see it from a different angle. We go with the point first, slide it right into there, and then you just drop it in. It's really quite that simple. You just drop it right into place. Now we're going to draw the thread up. We're going to draw the thread up. Let me see if this extra light... Does that help? I think that helps a little bit, doesn't it? It's a little dark over here. I'll just leave this light on for right now. Now you can see that shuttle a little bit more clearly. So now we're going to draw that thread up, right? Draw that thread up. I'm only going to close this door a little bit. Don't close it all the way. And then in the back, you're going to hold that thread that from the upper uh, threading. Hold on to it just a little bit as you rotate the balance wheel uh, towards yourself. And you'll see that needle kind of sweep down and grab that thread. And then we should be able to pull it up straight away. This always works. This always works a lot easier off camera, doesn't it? <laughs> Let me try that again. Open that door just a little bit more. Bring that thread over here. Oh, it's getting caught on the edge a little bit. There we go. 
All right, now I'm gonna draw that thread forward. I've got a little loop, you probably can't see it, but I've got a little loop underneath there. There we go, at last. Close our door. And now we've got those threads both in position, so we're ready to do a little bit of sewing, I think. Now, a little bit on the needle that I have in here today. I've got what's called, let me grab the actual case. And this actually came to me by way of this came to me by way of Susie from Minnesota when she sent me a goodie box at Christmas time with all kinds of fun things inside of there. All kinds of fun things. And one of the needle types that she sent me is by Schmetz. It's called a top stitch, a top stitch needle. And this is a size 9014. Does anyone want to type into the live chat what your understanding is uh, as to what a top stitch type needle does. The name kind of leads us a certain direction, doesn't it? But tell me what you think as far as what a needle like this is designed as far as its feature uh, and the needle design layout to do. And while you're doing that, I'm gonna get this set up. We'll do our first material sew off on here. have to cut a little bit of cotton material. I did not get that ready. I think we can shut that off now. I'm also going to show you the sew offs that I've got set up for this machine today. These are the sew offs that I prepared for us to try today on the live stream. And I'll show you the ones that I've already done off camera too. I've done some of this saddle grade leather, uh, some cotton without a stiffener, some of this uh, bubble gum material, this stuff right here. I also did some protected full grain leather, some of this, uh, Naga hide. I had to think about that for a second. Some of this Naga hide, and then also some more protected full grain leather. Just some general sew offs that I've done in this top stitch needle. I don't use top stitch needles a lot, um, and it's because it, it it's a little bit of a sensitive needle when it comes to going through a wide field of type uh, of sew off materials. So it doesn't usually work as well for me as uh, a more generalist needle like a universal needle. But we're going to give it a try today, see how it does. A bigger eye, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think Susie has given some great... Uh, Great points. Yeah, Susie's given some great points. And considering she was the one that gifted these needles to me, I trust that she probably did some research on these top stitch needles and uh, chose them for probably a specific project or just to try them out. But we're going to try them on a wide field of materials today and see how, see how they do. And I can tell you that the thread we're using is nothing fancy. The uh, Susie had mentioned it can handle a, a heavier thread. It's got a larger uh, needle eye, which is all true. Um, but we're going to be using just a standard Coates and Clark uh, XP uh, type thread that I use quite often on this channel. This is the thread actually that I'll be using today. 
and it's just a dual duty XP thread. Nothing fancy, nothing fancy, all purpose thread. I get this at Joann's uh, and uh, it generally does a really, really good job on pretty much any material. So you don't have to spend a, you don't have to spend a ton of money on thread, depending on the projects and the outcomes you're trying to bring. You can use a standard dual duty. It works very, very nicely. Okay, so 100% denim, that's almost kind of a go-to, isn't it? I always usually try to pull denim out because a lot of folks will sew denim. Protected full grain leather, I'll put the leather kind of in a separate pile. Saddle grade leather. I picked out another leather today that I haven't shown for quite a while. This is Italian leather. Look at the back of that. That nap is just a nightmare, isn't it? As far as, well, I'll really have to pull it back to show you the stitch quality uh, when we stitch this off. But Italian leather is fun to sew too. Then I've got a bunch of bunch more of this uh, protected uh, full grain leather. And we'll be sewing a couple layers of that. Uh, this Naga hide I have as well. I'll put that with the leathers, even though it's not a leather. Got some of this bubble gum material. Genuine elk hide. Put that on the bottom. And then I've got some compressed uh, felt as well that we'll try sewing uh, during the live stream today. So if there's any input as far as what you'd like to see me sew first, between the denim, the bubblegum material, the compressed felt in this pile, and then we've got the Naga hide, we've got the protected full grain leather, the Italian leather, the saddle grade leather and uh, genuine elk hide as well. I should probably put these together. This is also protected full grain leather as well. So anyone have any input on what you'd like to see this hand crank sew first? Because we got quite a few choices. There's more bubblegum material too. We have quite a few choices to pick from. Susie wants to see one of the leathers. Christine uses top stitch needles quite a bit. What do you see the primary uh, advantages being in using a top stitch needle, Christine, over say a universal needle uh, or another more specialized needle, depending on the materials you're sewing? What, are, what do you see as the main advantages? I'll wait for uh, Christine's response. I'm just curious to see what she says as far as the advantages. All right, Christine is typing something probably. So I'm going to go ahead and pick out one of these leathers because Susie just said one of the leathers. She didn't specify which one, so I'll go ahead and pick one. And Christine says she uses it in quilting, uses it, uses it in quilting, probably sewing uh, cottons and quilt batting and all that. So, and I've, I've heard, I've heard that the top stitch needles are good for multiple layers. Um, and as Susie had said, handling a heavier thread, but I don't work with them very often. I wouldn't be working with one right now if, Su if Susie from Minnesota had not been kind enough to send them to me. So so we will start. Why don't we start with some of this protected full grain leather? I have no idea why why I cut four pieces of this stuff. I was just feeling wild and crazy, apparently. So I'm going to set this down here. We'll try one of these to begin with. And then we'll launch into some of these other sew-offs as well. And I'll try to get you pretty close to the action if I can. So we'll start with a single layer of this uh, protected full grain leather. Again, our setup is we've got a size 9014 top stitch needle. 9014 top stitch needle. Which, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to try this out, see what we think of it. 
And I'm going to, you know, what I should probably do is at least initially, instead of showing you just down here at the needle, I should change the shot and kind of take you across the machine a little bit. So you can also see me cranking it off. I'm really excited to, to present this machine, especially to show it so that the owner, uh, Marcy, is able to see it because she knows how bad off it was when it came in. And now it's just turning like, as I told her on the phone, it's turning like butter. And like some of the other hand cranks as well and long shuttle machines, it doesn't hurt maybe to initially hold on to the threads in the back while you're launching. They tend to pull the thread quite a bit, and that way you can avoid getting a little bit of bird nesting on the bottom, or at least reduce the likelihood of that. All right, let's give this a go. We'll get uh, we'll get down this uh, protected full grain leather, and then we'll jump into some of these other material types. All right, here we go. Oh yeah, that's a lovely stitch. Let's see how let's see how I did on the um, the lock stitch on the underside. Oh, you know what I just did though? I pulled this and I ended up breaking the uh, the thread coming off of the long shuttle. So I'm going to have to pull that thread back up again. Let me give this a clip real quick. Oh yeah, that's some beautiful. Let me show you the stitching real quick before we before we pull that thread back up from the long shuttle because some beautiful, beautiful stitching on this uh, protected full grain. I just have to find my thread holder. All right, let me bring that camera over. Actually, I'll get it even a little bit closer. Let me bring it down here. And we get even closer to it. I'm wondering if I should put this behind it, if that's going to help us out in any way. It might help us out if I put that behind there. Christine is the one that had suggested creating a little block behind there, and that way the camera doesn't try to focus past it. All right, I'm kind of looking over my shoulder at the laptop, and I'm going to try to move it across very slowly. Well, I don't know what you're seeing, but what I'm seeing is some beautiful page 34, if not page 34 plus uh, stitching. Uh, the, the spacing, the formation of the stitch is just about as good as it can get. It's quite lovely, quite lovely stitching. Uh, and again, this is protected full grain leather, probably about three ounces of leather. So it's not a lightweight sew off. And this hand crank just went through it like a hiccup and did a beautiful job. Did a beautiful, I'm going to try to hold it still here. I've got it balanced on my knee right now, so it's a little jiggly. But some absolutely gorgeous stitching. Let's turn it over and look at that lock stitch. And again, the lock stitch, let me set the camera down, see if we can angle this a little bit differently and get maybe a little bit clearer view of it by me pulling it back. I don't know if it'll help or not. I'm going to give it a try. There you can see some of the stitching popping through. Again, depending on where they cut the leather from on the hide, we'll decide whether or not that nap is going to be more dense or it's going to be a little bit more thin. But right now we're getting some beautiful, beautiful stitch balance on this protected full grain leather. Both for the lock stitch and then by all means for the top stitch as well, which is absolutely, absolutely spectacular. Absolutely spectacular. I don't know how I can prove this. I don't know how I could improve this except maybe to step up to a leather needle 
And uh, we could always consider adding a roller foot to this machine as well uh, and uh, put it to work that way. But all in all, just absolutely spectacular. Hold on a second. Incoming call. I forgot to silence the phone. Uh, absolutely spectacular stitching with this first stitch off on this uh, protected full grain leather. So let me throw that to the back with the other pile of sew offs I've already got. And we will pull that thread back up again. Usually there's not an issue with the thread breaking like that, but some, something about it, it didn't like it, did it? So it gives us an opportunity for those that join the live stream a little bit late, gives us an opportunity to show them again. We'll verify the, uh, the long shuttle threading and we'll, re, we'll pull that thread out again so we're all set to go. Turn our little light on again. Give us a little bit of extra light on that long shuttle. Go ahead and pull this up. And again, what I'm using is a simple dental tool. I just kind of hook the edge of the shuttle and just kind of pull it out of that cradle very gently. You can see our thread broke right there. It broke right there. So I'm just going to pull this out real quick and just double check. Double, double check. This again is going to be our barbell bobbin or our long, long bobbin. And you're probably going to have a little bit of trouble seeing it, but that's that little hole I was talking about that the Fister and Rossman people added. There's a little hole right there on the edge of this long uh, bobbin. And that's the one that you have to slide into that right mounting point when you're winding the bobbin, because there's another pin that goes through there and kind of holds this in place so that it's not gonna slip as some of the long bobbins uh, tend to do when, when you're trying to wind them. So bring that thread around the back again. So again, it's gonna be turning uh, counterclockwise as it's dispensing the, uh, the thread, drop that back in there, kind of draw it through here. And again, what you do is you draw it down to the bottom. And then we're going to hold the top of this at the same time. And then we're going to draw it back up through here to get it underneath that tension band. See, I'm kind of drawing it and pulling it. And then it goes underneath this little tension band right here to maintain uh, tension to define that top stitch. Now we're going to go ahead and drop this back in. Again, you put the point in first is the way I do it. Put that point in first. The other thing I'm going to make a quick adjustment on real quick is I did, as I was doing final sew offs, I did bump this up quite a bit. I'm just going to go a little bit counterclockwise to reduce this pull a little bit because I think it may be a little bit excessive right now. I think we can get a nice top stitch without it being cranked so far clockwise. So I'm just going to go just a hair back the other way. So we are right about at the 12 o'clock position. I just moved it to about the 11 o'clock position. Might even go just a hair more. I can always adjust it back if we need to. There we go. Now I'm going to put that point in first and just drop it into position. Kind of close that door a little bit. Then we're going to grab that back thread and we'll see if we can pull that thread back up again. There we go. Draw that back and just see if that's pulling more easily. I think that was kind of catching a little bit on there. All right, let's give this a go again. So now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing 
more protected full grain leather. We did a single layer already with a great outcome. I'm just curious if this hand crank is able to handle using this type of needle. Again, we're using this type of needle. It's not a leather needle. It's a top stitch needle. Christine from Canada, this is her go-to needle for a lot of the quilting that she does. And obviously when you're sewing cotton and quilt batting and such, it's going to be a little bit of a different uh, reaction that the needle has to that type of material versus trying to go through four to six ounces of protected full grain leather. But I'm just curious to try it. If we get a bad outcome, then we know that we pushed this needle too far. Uh, but I'm willing to give it a try and just see what kind of outcome we get. Because I know that folks are curious to see what tolerances different types of needles have because they're all going to be designed a little bit differently, aren't they? But this is what we're going to attempt to go through using this top stitch needle. That's about as thick as a thick belt right there. You can see it from the side. That is some serious, serious leather. And we'll see if, see if this uh, needle is able to handle it. I know that the machine can handle it, but we'll see if that the needle is able to handle this much leather. I, I don't know. Didn't try it. Didn't try it off camera with protected full grain leather. I think it's going to be a little bit too much for the machine. We probably will be able, be able to get away with sewing two thicknesses of saddle grade, but I don't think we'll be able to get through protected full grain, two layers of it, because protected, again, is going to have a chemical coating on it that protects it from staining, but it also fortifies that surface and gives it greater durability. So I think it's going to be, I think it'll be a little bit too much for this type of needle. A little bit too much. But we'll give it a try. We'll give it a try, see what we get. All right, just kind of looking over my shoulder at the camera again. We'll kind of change the angle a little bit there. Actually, I'm going to move it to the end because it's kind of in my way a little bit. Let me move it to the end. <clears throat> there we go. Okay, again, I don't know what kind of outcome we're going to get. This is going to be, this is going to be tough. This is going to be very, very tough. We'll see what happens. All right, so two layers of protected full grain leather. I'm just going to hold that thread initially while we launch, and we'll see if we can even get through this. The machine is turning like butter now, but this is a really, really hard sew off. We'll see if we can get through it. Here we go. Keep your fingers crossed. And you know what else I should do real quick? Let me also grab a couple of my little clips that Paula Noel sent me and see if we can give this a little bit better of a chance of holding together. I tend to sew two pieces together and they go all kinds, they go all over the place. See if we can reduce that likelihood a little bit. Again, I, I don't know that I would recommend trying this with a top stitch type needle. But not because it'll hurt the machine, but just because I don't think it's probably the right setup. But we're going to give it a try, see what happens. We might be surprised. We might be pleasantly surprised to see how it handles uh, this much leather. All right, let's give it a go. Here we go. Give that a quick hold. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That needle is, that needle is literally hitting it like a brick wall. It's literally hitting that, those two layers of protective full grain leather like a brick wall. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to give it a try. All right. A little bit of, little bit of encouragement, you guys, uh, in your own places, wherever you're watching this, go, yeah, go, Scott, go, Scott, go, Scott, go. Ha! Ah! <laughs> no guarantees. We'll see how we do. Here we go. Oh, my gosh. It's a lot of leather. A lot of leather. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I think it's too much, you guys. I think it's too much. The machine is going, are you insane? Are you absolutely insane? I think it's too much. We got it. We got about seven or eight stitches off. I'm going to try to get down the rest of the line, but I'm telling you, it is not. Yeah, I, I don't think that these these top stitch needles are are saying we are not designed for leather, buddy. Not this much leather anyway. We're not designed for this much leather. All right, let me try it again. I'll see how far we can get. Oh, my gosh. 
it's literally as that needle comes down and makes contact with those two layers, it's like a brick wall. Oh my gosh, here we go. Here, let's try it again. We get a little bit of rocking going on here, a little bit of rocking. All right, keep your fingers crossed. I took my, my little clips off and now the leather is going all kinds. It's going all different directions. <laughs> I got some really good looking stitches on the backside too. But when I lifted up the needle and the material was sliding all over the place, I've got a little bit of a weird stitch line on the back. So just tilt your head to the side and it'll look like it's straight. I guarantee it. It'll look like it's straight. <laughs> We do. You know why people love this channel? They love it because of all of you, especially once they meet you in a live stream. But they also love this channel because we just do crazy stuff. I mean, where else are you going to see somebody with a 1948 German hand crank, Fister and Rossman, sewing two layers of protected full grain leather using a top stitch needle? You're just not going to see it. I mean, anyone with common sense would say, uh, yeah, let's not do that anymore. Let's not do that anymore. <laughs> All right, let's move this over here and take a look at the stitching. In spite of the challenges that we just encountered with this machine, with a needle we're using, this machine saying, oh, wow, are you crazy? Are you crazy, man? I think we still got some really good looking stitching out of this. I'm kind of amazed. I'm kind of amazed, to be honest with you. All right, let me see if I can get a good position to hold the camera still. And we'll take a look at this stitching. I'm just going to pause right there and say, you know what? And I shouldn't say words that have a P in them because then I puff this little blocker thing out of the way. But I'm just going to say that that is some gorgeous, gorgeous top stitching. So, you know what? Credit to... Credit to Christine in saying this is her go-to needle for quilting. She uses this type of needle all the time for quilting up in Canada. And uh, I'm seeing some beautiful stitching, even though it's not designed to sew leather. Let's go across and look at all the stitching. We're going to see a little bit of a wonkiness as I had some trouble with feeding this leather and this needle being able to pierce it. This needle just did not want to go through this much leather. It was like, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. See right there, right there. You can see where I had that little, that little issue. And I ended up raising the presser foot bar and I was trying to get that leather back into position right there. We had a little hiccup and that's my fault. And then we got back on track and finished off that stitch line with some absolutely gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous stitching. Wow. Wow. Look at it from the top, the thickness that we went through. You wonder why that needle was saying, uh, no, thank you. No, thanks. Thanks anyway. I think I'll take a pass on that, but thanks for offering. So nice of you. Ha ha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to say that I am amazed. I'm amazed. Again, not because the machine got through it, but because it got through it using a needle that's designed for quilting and top stitching. Christine uses this needle all the time, but she doesn't sew eight ounces of leather using this type of needle. I doubt it. Maybe, but I doubt it. So, and we got, I mean, other than the little hiccup down here, which happened when I raised up the presser foot, and we we're having the remember the material was kind of pitching out of alignment. It was pitching out of alignment, and we had like a little hiccup there. But the rest of the stitching is just crazy beautiful. It's crazy beautiful. It really is. Once I get the camera pointing that way, it's crazy beautiful. I'm amazed. I'm literally amazed. 
Wow. Look at that from the side, what we just went through. So Susie was curious. Susie from Minnesota was curious to see how these would do on leather. There you go, Susie. We just went through about eight ounces of protected full grain leather. And other than when the material started to pitch out of alignment, it was feeding, uh, feeding kind of cockeyed. And I had to lift the presser foot and get it back on track. Other than that little hiccup down here, beautiful stitching all the way across. Beautiful stitching all the way across. All right, let's look at the lock stitch. I've been like blah, blah, blahing about this. Let's look at the lock stitch, see how that maintained. Again, that's a product of our upper tension. Let's start on this end over here. And then we'll get down to the little gollaby gook on the end that I created when this thing was feeding out of alignment. All right, here we go. I'm just going to pause right there and say, wow, wow, absolutely gorgeous stitching. Also for our lock stitch, using again, a top stitch needle, a top stitch needle that uh, Christine uses for quilting. She doesn't use it to sew leather jackets regularly, if ever, but this machine, machine number one handled it beautifully. And the needle also stepped up to the plate and said, I can do this. I can do this. And look at what it did. Absolutely. What? Let me move it. There we go. Now I'm pointed the right way. I've got to keep looking over my shoulder because I think I have the camera angled right, but I don't. Absolutely gorgeous stitching. This again is our lock stitch. This is our lock stitch. There's a little gobby gook on the end there. So other than the section where the, the material was starting to pitch as it was being fed and I had to realign it, all the other stitching for our lock stitching is just absolutely as it should be. Absolutely amazing. Wow. I'll tell you though, this, this machine, when it hit this leather with that, uh, with that, uh, top stitch needle. Oh my gosh. It was like, it was like trying to take a pin and push it through cement. It was like trying to take a pin and push it through cement, but I'm going to go ahead and move this to the side and just say, I am utterly, utterly impressed. Utterly impressed. Wow. I didn't think it could do it. I, I was skeptical that that top stitch needle would be able to even get through those two layers of protected full grain leather. And yet it did. Absolutely amazing. Amazing. All right, let's do some other leather. Since we're kind of on a leather fest right now. We'll go ahead and do some saddle grade leather, I think, as well. We'll do a single layer of saddle grade, and then I'll add a second layer to it afterwards. And then I've got this elk hide as well. I'm not going to do any more protected full grain leather because this machine is just like, get rid of that stuff. Get rid of it. I don't want to see any more of this blue stuff. I just went through two layers of it, Scott. I went through two layers of it, and I've done my duty. Get rid of it. Okay. Shoo. Gone. Gone. Yes. All right, so now we're going to try some saddle grade leather. Let me move the rest of this to the side. We'll do one layer to start, and then we'll add a second layer to it. We will try to add a second layer to it. <clears throat> and I didn't even show you all, but this is our presser foot adjuster right up here. And it's like all the other ones. You just turn it clockwise to increase it, turn it counterclockwise to decrease it. I probably should have bumped this up even higher, although I've got it bumped up pretty high right now uh, to do those two layers of protected full grain leather. But I think I'll leave it. I'll leave it right where it's at for right now. I think we'll leave it right there. All right. So a single layer of saddle grade leather after 
the last sew off we did, this should be a walk in the park. This should be a no brainer. So let's see how she does on this. There we go. Let's see how she does on this. Get this initial launch going and all right, keep your fingers crossed. I hope we don't I hope we don't destroy this needle. <laughs> we might have already destroyed it. Here we go. All right, let's rotate that around. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. I almost, I almost want to say, let me look at it from a different angle. I almost want to say that we might need to decrease our upper tension a little bit because I'm looking at this saddle grade leather and I'm not seeing as poppy of a top stitch. Not the poppy, the top stitch isn't quite as poppy, but remember I also, because I was concerned, I had turned it down too far when I had the long shuttle out. I turned this back to about 11 o'clock. Remember it was on 12 o'clock and I turned it to 11 o'clock on the shuttle itself to reduce the top stitch pull down. And I lost a little bit of my definition doing that, but we can fix that. We can fix that by simply adjusting this back a little bit. Again, when we reduce this a little bit, we then give greater pull down ability to that long shuttle. I just don't want to go too far with this or we'll, or we'll lose our lock stitch definition. I'm going to turn it back just a little bit. Hope I didn't go too far. All right, here we go. Let's see what happens. Pull this thread out. And we'll look at both of these side by side. It's not a bad top stitch, but I think we could have better definition, a little bit better definition with it. It's actually quite nice, but it could be better. It can always be better, right? That's one of our principles. Does that, anyone remember me mentioning something called Kanai? C-A-N-I? Kanai? If anyone knows what Kanai stands for, and it's the principle of the way I service machines, restore machines, it's the way I interact with machines in general. It's always trying to do something. And Kanai kind of defines that. If anyone remembers what that is, C-A-N-I. Yeah, yeah, that's quite nice. Quite nice. Let's give you, again, it's, it's just, you can have just a little bit better defi definition. I'm going to stitch it one more time. And with that little adjustment of that upper tension, we'll see if we can get a little bit more, a little bit more poppiness on that top stitch. It's not bad at all. It's quite good, but it's not quite as poppy as I think it could be. All right, let's give this a go. Again, just give a little hold to those threads when you're first launching. And once you get into locomotion, then you can go ahead and let go of them. But it just, when you initially are cranking it, it'll start to pull that thread and it'll create a little bit of a bird nest at the launching point if you don't hold onto the thread. So, all right, let's give this a second run. I didn't turn it much, but we'll see how it how it reacts to this. Otherwise, we might pull that long shuttle out and I might turn it just a little bit back clockwise again so we get that more poppiness for the top stitch. All right, here we go. I may have a little bit of a barb on our needle. I heard it kind of catch that thread a little bit as it was trying to move it. Kind of caught that thread a little bit. Oh yeah, that's that's better. That's as far as I'm going to go with it right now, but that's that's much better, I think. It's much better. Oops. And I just had my thread let loose on that long shuttle again. I think I I think I still have that tension maybe a little bit too high. That thread is not feeding. It could be also that I didn't do as good of a job in winding. Winding a a long shuttle is a little bit more tricky. And if I didn't do a good job of winding it, yeah, that's some good looking stitching. We didn't lose any of our lock stitch on the back. If I didn't do a good enough job of winding this long bobbin, it'll tend to feed out a little bit more unevenly too, won't it? Let me set that over there. We'll go ahead and give another pull on this. Did it let loose? I'm trying to see. 
just right on the edge there. This is a great way to show you, great great way to show you just how, how to do this. You can see right there with a the thread. And that could also be because we're using that, uh, that top stitch needle that has a larger eye. It's allowing this thread to wiggle around a little bit more and it's causing it to, uh, to kind of catch. Let me see what we got going on in here. Just kind of pull that out real quick. Yeah, see, I got a little bit of a bump right there. Usually when you're winding uh, long bobbins like this, you want to have the outer edges. You want to have the outer edges a little bit higher up and almost like it's, you know, these are going to be raised up, raised up here, and it kind of curves into the middle, almost like with a little, uh, a little valley. And right now when I wound this, I didn't do as good of a job. So I've got a little bit of a bump right here that might be causing this, uh, this, this uh, barbell bobbin to not be turning as evenly as it should be, which is why we had that breaking. So what I'm going to do real quick is I'm just going to pull some of this excess thread off to lower that bump down. I don't know if you can see that bump or not. There's a bump right there. Take off some of this thread. See if I can lower that bump down just a little bit. Now, it's not dramatic, but you look at that now where I had wound this. You know, I was kind of rushing a little bit. I wound it a little bit more hastily, and I had a bump right there. It was a raised area where that thread had built up a little bit more here. Now, I've just lowered that a little bit. Maybe that will help us a little bit as far as this thread feeding better. But that really is a major factor, not just when you're winding barbell bobbins or long bobbins like this, but any bobbin. You want to get that thread uh, nice and even. Uh, across the the barbell itself. All right, let's give us a try. So again, I'm just going to drop it in. Pull this down. And you kind of pull it across there. You can see it's underneath the edge of that little rim right there. So it's underneath that tension band. And then I'm just going to, as I did before, I showed this to you already. I'm going to slide that point in first and then just drop it into that cradle so that it's in that cradle space. We're getting quite good at pulling thread up at this point. And I think I would attribute it to my being a little bit too hasty and how I wound this uh, barbell bobbin when I was setting this machine up. You know, initially it was rotating just fine, and now it's catching that just a little bit on there, isn't it? All right, let's draw that thread back now. And if you goof up like me and you wind that long bob in a little bit uh, cattywampus, as my father would have said, it's not that difficult to pull that shuttle out, as you've seen me do a couple of times now, in order to get that back into position again. Now, let's take a look at the stitching. Let's take a look at the stitching. We did Both of these rows are going to look really, really good. But I think the one has just a little bit more of a poppiness to it because we made that adjustment on that upper tension. Let's see what you guys think. So the bottom row is going to be our second row that we did. Going to have just a little bit more poppiness to it. Oh, let me get my, uh, my backdrop thing here. There we go. Maybe that'll help a little bit. So as you're looking across, as you're looking across at this stitching, you're going to see that top row is a little bit less defined. 
as I move across, I think you'll see that the bottom row that we did second is going to have just a little bit better clarity of stitch to it. They're both not bad. They're actually quite good. But I think the bottom one is just a little bit better when we made that upper tension adjustment. But again, we're using a needle that really is not designed for this type of sewing, for leather sewing. And we're really kind of beating it up pretty hard. We're still just a little bit weak on that uh, top stitch. We could probably even adjust it a little bit more, even a little bit more. As a matter of fact, we'll do that real quick. I just hope I don't go too far and have the thread breaking. Let's do that real quick. Oh, I didn't show you the lock stitch, duh. Here's the lock stitch on the back. Beautiful, beautiful lock stitching. I would say that the lock stitching is actually a little bit overdefined, which is why we're getting a little bit of a weaker top stitch. The top stitch is not bad, but it could be better. It could definitely be better. Okay, let's just make a, a quick adjustment on the shuttle. This actually is good for you to see me do this multiple times so you're less intimidated by, oh, I, once I get that sucker in, I don't have to pull it out. We've had to pull, we've had to pull it out a couple of times already. I'm just gonna catch a little edge of that. We'll kind of pull it out here. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab my little screwdriver and I'm just gonna do a light little bump up a light little bump up. So I'm just going to turn this screw back to the 12 o'clock position. I turned it back and now I'm going to turn it back again. So I just barely adjusted that. I, it was right about at 11 o'clock position, if you can think of it like that, like a clock. It was right about at the 11 o'clock position. I went almost back to the 12 o'clock position. I didn't turn it quite as far. So hopefully we don't get, because the problem is if you try to adjust this tension too much and it's putting a lot of pressure down on this band against the thread, you will have a tendency to have the thread break as we experienced a couple of times. But I think that was more of a product of me not doing as good of a job in winding the long bobbin and having that little bump area that we, elim we, we didn't totally eliminate it, but we certainly flattened it out quite a bit. So let's put it back in again. And we'll see if that little adjustment hopefully will help us as far as getting a little bit more of a poppy top stitch. There we go. Bring my thread to the side. We'll pull this thread up again. And we'll see if we can test to see what impact we brought. See what impact we brought as far as that top stitch definition.
So you can see it's not overly cumbersome. If for whatever reason you have to pull that out, uh, it's fairly easy to make the adjustment, put it back in, and uh, get it back to doing its thing again. So, so what we did is we bumped it up a little bit. We're going to do one more stitch row on this single layer of saddle grade leather, and we'll compare the three, our first one, our second one, and then finally our third row that we're going to do. All right, let me give a quick hold on that thread and we'll crank this off now. So the lesson you can learn from I do. Hold on a second. That is catching on there a little bit. Hold on a second. See that? We bumped it up again and we're getting a, a breaking on the thread. So I think the, we're going to have to make our adjustment up top. Normally, I would make more adjustments on the long shuttle itself so we don't have to manipulate the upper tension quite as much. But again, because of the needle type we're using with an oversized uh, eye on it, it's stressing this thread. This is not, it's not delicate thread, but it's not as strong as some threads that we could be using. So I think what we need to do is adjust it back again, and we'll make the adjustments for this uh, up top. So it's a good lesson to learn. I mean, we can try doing fine tuning uh, using the shuttle, and a lot of people are more reluctant to make adjustments on the bobbin case or on the long shuttle. But hopefully, you know, you seeing me and watching what I've done to try to get the outcome we want, you can see how sometimes it's it's the right solution, but sometimes depending on the thread it's not the best solution that we could use. So, and, and the needle as well. So I'm gonna pull this out again. I'm also gonna add a little bit more lubricant to this as well to make sure that we're getting some nice turn on that long bobbin as well. And again, just a little bit of machine oil inside of here will help quite a bit as far as these turning. So we've adjusted this back again to where we started. All right, I'm going to drop it back in there again. What I'm doing is I'm drawing it down underneath that spring, and then I'm drawing it back up underneath that spring. If you don't get it underneath the spring, you won't have any uh, tension whatsoever. I got too anxious. Let me try that again. All right.
hopefully that will allow us, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do real quick here is I'm going to adjust this upper tension back a little bit, which hopefully will give us that balance. We're not able to do it through the shuttle right now using the type of thread and the needle we are, so we've got to do it from up top. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, let's give a look at this. That was a little bit of a battle that we just had, but it was a good learning lesson, wasn't it? You could see me trying to manipulate the top stitch uh, presentation by making adjustments on the long shuttle, on the shuttle down below. But the problem is when you're working with a certain type of needle and a certain type of thread, if you push that tension down there too far, you're gonna have a persistent issue with that thread breaking, kind of like we were experiencing. So now I made a slight adjustment up top and we ended up getting the right result that we were hoping for. Let me just see if I can get this to... Yeah, the thread is starting to break again. I might have some bad thread on here. I might have to change this thread out, this top thread. Yep, I might have to change the top thread on here. Let me show you what we got first of all as I battle this process here. Sometimes uh, sometimes the journey is easy and going into the new year, sometimes the, the journey can be a little bit more of a challenge, can't it? That's okay. So the top row is the first one we did. The bottom row is the second one that we did or the third one we did, I should say. So we started all the way up here. We went through there, and then we finally did this final row down here. Our goal was to see if we could bump up the appearance of that lock stitch and also the top stitch and get a good balance. And I think we finally did that after battling this for quite a bit. Let's see what we got. And again, all three rows are, are decent top stitches. They're all decent top stitches. But I think the bottom one, if I can get the right camera angle on it, is going to show us a little bit more pop. Just a little bit better pop. I do like the look of that top row, though, too. Now, matter of fact, now that I'm thinking about it, wait a second. I may have this upside down. I think the top row is our third. Yeah, I think I put this upside down. Hold on a second. I think I have it correct now. <laughs> this was our first, I believe. This is our second. And I think that's our third on the bottom. You can see the definition change between those lines. They're all, oh, I forgot to put this back here. They're all decent looking top stitches, but I think that bottom row is going to be just a little bit of a grade above. And again, I'm testing this on a material that this needle is not really designed to be sewing. We've really pushed this kind of hard. Let's turn over and look at the lock stitch. I think the lock stitch all in all is looking really, really good.
So that was quite a battle. That was quite a battle, quite a battle in order to try to get this to work. And where I could have gone with a more appropriate needle, I wanted to give these a try, but it sure creates a little bit of a wrinkle when you're trying to sew with certain materials like this. Also with the thread type I'm using and the needle, my initial path of trying to make adjustments on that shuttle proved to be the wrong track to be taking. It just, it's the wrong track. It's absolutely the wrong track where I'm creating so much tension down there and it's breaking that thread because that, you know, again, the eye of the needle is going to be kind of like almost the gateway and guiding that thread as far as it's passing through. And right now we've got a really, really wide gateway and it's stressing this thread along with the fact that I turned the shuttle up too high. It's still maybe a little bit high right now for the sewing that we're doing with this needle. We may have to adjust it again, but it's a great lesson to see the struggles as we overcome things and we eventually get an outcome like this, where this bottom row, I think I've got it facing right way, the correct way now. This bottom row is just a spectacular example of page 34 uh, plus type stitching. I think it's actually the top row. <laughs> I'm so defuddled right now after battling this. The top row is our last row. We kind of flipped it around after I showed you the lock stitch. But we've got some gorgeous stitching now, finally, after battling this, uh, this setup that I've chose for the machine. So maybe my New Year's resolution should be, don't push the boundaries quite as far, Scott. If you're sewing leather, use a leather needle. If you're sewing other materials, use a leather use a, a needle more appropriate to those or go with a universal needle like you usually do. But it's fun to try something new, even though we had to struggle through this so we could see what impact we were able to bring and get a final result that is just absolutely spectacular, both with the top stitch and with this lock stitch as well. And again, saddle grade leather using a top stitch needle, probably not a great idea, but it's fun. It's fun. At least it's fun for you to watch me struggle with it a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to make one more adjustment on our long shuttle. I feel like we're doing like an, a long shuttle series here. We're doing a long shuttle series. How do you take a long shuttle out? Well, Scott's done it several times. He's done it several times, and I think he can do it again. Yeah, he can. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right, I'm going to set that right there for a second. All right, I'm going to adjust this back even a little bit further because of our setup. So what I'm doing is I'm taking this shuttle, which is becoming very, very familiar to us. And where I had it at 12 and I turned it back to 11, now I'm going to go back even a little bit further. Going back even a little bit further and see if we can adjust it from up top more and stress, stress this thread down below just a little bit less. So I just turned it right back. It's probably going to be hard to see it in the shot, but I just turned it back to almost a 10 o'clock position now because we're continuing. I took that bump out of the long bobbin that I had created when I wound it. And um, I think that making this adjustment now, hopefully we'll be able to get some decent feed without the thread continuing to break. But it is what it is. I mean, when you're, Dealing with a setup like this, it has some inherent challenges for sure. All right. So now you're becoming experts on this, how to load a barbell bobbin into the shuttle, because I've done it multiple times, haven't I? I've done it multiple times. We're getting quite good at it. I'm getting quite proficient at threading this. 
Okay, so we've got it threaded again, and that actually felt a little bit nicer as I was drawing it through there. So I think hopefully that will help us as we're doing these final sew-offs. So I just dropped it back in there again. Again, you go with the point first, and then you just lower the blunt end, as they refer to it, of the shuttle in second into the carriage, and it just kind of floats in that carriage in the sewing process. All right, so let's draw this thread up again, as we've done several times. And we'll draw that thread forward. And we'll see if that adjustment that I just made on the long shuttle so that it's stressing the thread a little bit less is going to ultimately help us. I hope it does. All right, we'll bring that to the rear. So what you learned today in this live stream, and it was not the lesson I planned on showing you specifically, but you learned that there are different ways to deal with balancing tension factors. Usually we try to make the adjustments up top, but I decided to take a different path and adjust it down below. And uh, if I'm working with a heavier thread, I think that would work out fine. But when we're dealing with the thread that we are with the needle that we are, it can create some issues, can't it? All right, I'm just going to migrate into some denim and give this a try. Hopefully, I can do it without breaking a thread or breaking a needle. Um, normally, I would go ahead and just jump in the six layers of this straight away, but I'm going to give it four layers to start, and um, we'll see how this uh, top stitch needle handles this. So I've got two layers to start. I'm going to go ahead and fold it in half and get us up to four layers. Still not a light sew-off at all. You look at it from the side there. But I'm going to persevere and move forward and see if I can get through this stitch line without breaking the thread or creating other havoc. And if I continue to have trouble, I'm probably going to have to change this needle out. Because if I, if I have developed a burr on this needle, it's just going to continue to shred this thread and give me challenges. But I'm going to try this stitch line on here before I go to the drastic step of trying to change out a needle. Those of you that follow me know that I love to go from start to finish with the same needle because I believe in Schmetz needles so much. Uh, but in this case, we might have to change it out with this top stitch needle. And also I did all the other sewing. This is what we did on camera, all of this on camera today. And then the before camera stuff. So, so far we've done all of this on this top stitch needle already. A lot of leather sewing with it because I wanted to see how, how it would perform with leather sewing. Plus I did cotton as well, obviously, but let's see, let's see how it does at this point. Uh, and then I'll look at the, the reluctantly, I'll look at the step of possibly changing out that needle. So a long time I've said it, you know, needle is not, it's more so the preparation of the machine, which I still believe but certain extreme circumstances, that needle can really create some havoc. So I think I'm learning some lessons myself as we enter the new year on how far to push needles. All right, let's give this a go. Let's see how we do. Here we go. It hit that denim really hard. It hit that denim almost as hard as it hit that leather. It hit it really hard. I hope I hope I can push this needle to the end, but I, I might have to change it out. I think I've got a burr on there. All 
All right, let me take these little clips off. We'll look at this denim. Yeah, all in all, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with the four layers of denim. And again, I'm not an expert on top stitch needles. Christine up in Canada uses them to sew uh, quilting, which is going to be a cotton usually with some quilt batting. We're using them on leather. We're using them on denim, not just, a, you know, one or two layers of denim, but we just did four layers of denim. And uh, I think all in all, we got a good looking stitch, but there, you know, there probably is going to be a little bit of fine adjusting as we look at how this needle and how this setup is responding to, to denim now. I think our, our lock stitch might have to be adjusted back just a little bit. Let's take a look at these. I think we've got a really good looking top stitch now, but I think we might have taken a little bit away from the lock stitch. Hold on a second. Let me get my little divider back there again, see if that helps as far as the camera focus. I'm really pleased with how these stitches are presenting on these four layers of denim. I'm really, really pleased. I think we've got some very, very good looking stitching. And I think we were able to, after we battled, after we battled, battled, battled that, uh, that shuttle in trying to make the adjustments down there, I think going up top, which is what I would typically do anyway, uh, has given us a better outcome, at least on this stitch line, for this uh, heavy grade denim. Whoops. Let me adjust my camera up a little bit there. You're looking at the carpet and you're going, the carpet looks fine, but we want to see the stitches. Pause right there. These are kind of tucked under underneath a little bit. I'll kind of change the camera angle again a little bit. So I'm seeing a, I don't know what you're seeing on your end, but I'm seeing a very, very nicely defined uh, top stitch. Uh, we were having it underserved. I tried adjusting that shuttle to my demise as it kept breaking the thread because it was binding down there. I had too much tension on that band on the shuttle for that thread to be able to feed out. Now we adjusted it back almost to the 10 o'clock position and we're still getting a nicely defined top stitch because we adjusted this back as well, our upper tension. Now let's see if we lost that lock stitch. I hope we didn't, but we may have diminished its, uh, its poppiness a little bit because of our adjustment. That's where you sometimes, you sometimes will go back and forth and you'll have an underserved top stitch. You'll make an adjustment to give more poppiness to that top stitch, but then you'll diminish the lock stitch. And if you take the path that I did in trying to adjust the shuttle, you might experience thread breaking depending on your setup. So let's take a look at these stitches. I think all in all, they look, they look pretty good. But again, I think they might've lost a little bit of their poppiness. All right, here we go. All in all, a pretty good looking lock stitch, but I think we did lose, we lost a little bit of the poppiness of it in adjusting that upper tension to give us a, a better uh, top stitch. I think what I would have to do is I would have to adjust this back a little bit now. And again, when you sew between a wide field of materials, like I do on these live streams, we don't just sew one material type. We jump around between leather and denim and compressed felt and everything else. 
we can all of a sudden encounter uh, issues with that stitch tension balance and we've got to adjust it accordingly. It's not a bad lock stitch, but I think I think a little bit more poppiness. A little bit more poppiness. Okay, I'm going to move this denim to the back. I'm not going to stitch it off again at this point. But if I wanted to give a little bit more definition to this, you can see our top stitch looks spot on. But I want to give a little bit more definition to this lock stitch through these four layers of heavy grade denim. Then I would go ahead and turn this upper tension back clockwise just a tiny little bit. I'm actually going to do that right now. Turn it back a little bit more just to give a little bit more of a balance. Right now we're getting a lot more poppiness on the top than on the lock side. It's real close. It's close, but it's it's not balanced exactly for sewing denim at least. So... All right, what else do I have that we can sew off on? I'll try to get your input on this real quick as we're looking at this. I've done saddle grade leather already. I've got this Naga hide left, which is a fake leather. I've got compressed felt left. I think we already sewed. Did we already sewed Italian leather. I don't think we did. That's our Italian leather right there. Yep, we didn't sew Italian leather yet. And then I didn't do uh, elk hide either yet, I don't think. Let me double check. I don't think I see elk, elk hide yet either. And, um, and then I've got this uh, naga hide stuff as well. So this is what I have left right now, is I've got the bubblegum material, I've got the elk hide, the Italian leather, I've got the compressed felt, and then I've got this Naga hide, which is a high vinyl content, uh, man-made to look like leather type material. And I've got one or two layers of that that we can potentially sew. I'm really getting kind of nervous about this needle and what we've already pushed it through, but we're going to continue to try to push forward as best as we can and see what results we get on these final sew-offs. But I'll definitely put a fresh needle in and it will not be a top stitch needle when I uh, hand this machine over to uh, Marcy on Tuesday. She'll actually be picking the machine up on Tuesday. Let's see, Sunny, um, I have one of the last ones made. Oh, Christine is sharing about one of her treasures. Christine is sharing about one of her treasures and uh, uh, Sunny was responding to that. I was trying to figure out the context of that in relation to what we were doing, but I get it now. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. All right. So let's try felt now. Susie is saying, give felt a try. Let's give felt a try. And hopefully the adjustments we've made will, will serve us okay. I'm going to try one layer to begin with and then we'll see what, what result we get and then we'll move on to two.
Very nice. Very nice. I'm going to make one quick adjustment, though. Make one quick adjustment. Yeah, I think I... The other thing I'm going to do real quick... Well, I shouldn't say real quick because she doesn't pick it up until Tuesday, but I'm going to wind another bobbin, too. Uh, because this bobbin, I think I did a poor job of winding it. Just goes to show you that winding a bobbin is really a critical step in setting the machine up. Because even though I took that little bump out, I'm, I'm curious now if I have other sections of that bobbin that are not wound as well as they should be either. I'll make one quick little adjustment here. This is our top stitch. I noticed that our lock stitch is a little bit underdefined, so I'm just going to bump this up a little bit more. And we'll stitch it off one more time to see if we can get a little bit more poppiness back to that lock stitch again. Yep, that's exactly what I was hoping for. Let me get, see if I can get this thread to feed. And we'll take a look at this felt. I've only done a single layer because I'm getting a little bit anxious about what I may have done to this top stitch needle and sewing all of that leather. And we've got these few sew-offs left to do, so I'm going to see if I can maybe be a little bit more conservative than I usually am. Okay, so... Stitch line. Yeah, let's take a look at these. Okay, we've got our, our first row of stitching up here on the top row, and then our second row below. I adjusted, I adjusted it up. <laughs> I adjusted it up to get a little bit more definition on the bottom. And I think we maintain the top stitch well overall, but it really is a, a balancing act sometimes in trying to go between the material diversity that I do and not take away from one when you give to the other. So let's see how we did. Both rows are looking pretty good. They're both looking pretty good. I would say that they're page 34, but again, I, I don't know about this top stitch needle in relation to compressed felt. I think if we were using a different needle, we might be getting a little bit better result, but it's, it's not bad. It's actually quite good. Try to get my camera to focus. I, after dropping it, I hope I didn't damage the camera. Hopefully it's starting to focus in a little bit.
Okay, I'm not going to belabor this anymore. I think we've got some decent looking top stitching. Uh, again, the stitch product you get is a result of the preparation of the machine and the setup as well. And right now our setup is a little bit uh, unusual compared to the path. Whoops. Compared to the path that we normally take, as I as I say the words that have P's in them again, I keep blowing things over. So all in all, a really good looking top stitch. A very, whoops, there we are. Now we're back on camera. I think all in all, a good looking top stitch on both of those rows and um, making that adjustment to get that lock stitch more defined. I don't think we lost much on the back. I think it's actually going to come in a little bit better. All right, so this is our lock stitch now. Again, the first row on the top one was before the adjustment. The one on the bottom is after it. But again, I, I just I don't know about this needle. I just don't know. Yeah, that bottom row, I'm seeing a little bit more poppiness coming out. A little bit more poppiness. Yeah, right there you can see you can see in particular the contrast where I I bumped up that upper tension a little bit to define this better after the second stitch line or before the second stitch line I should say and you can see the results there. So tension is not as is not as difficult as most people think. It's just trying to find that sweet balance. And it changes with material types and it changes with setup as well. There in particular, if I hold it real still. Okay. I'm going to move on. <laughs> and I think I'm going to, again, because of, because of the stressing of this uh, needle, I think, with what I've done to it, I think we'll move on to, we'll see how it handles Naga Hide. Naga Hide is going to be a, a big test because of the vinyl content in it. And uh, we'll see if we can get that. But so far in this needle, you know, without taking too much away from a top stitch needle, so far in, on this needle, we've done all of these sew offs already, both on camera and off camera. And once I decided to, to give up the ghost as far as trying to make the adjustment I wanted, using that shuttle as the means to do it. And I adjusted it back so that we stopped breaking the thread. I think we're going to probably get a lot better wrap up to this live stream without me having to take the shuttle in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. But I also, uh, you know, it's a great learning lesson. Anyone's, anyone's struggle as they're trying to overcome whatever challenge it is, is going to be a lesson for someone else. So even when I have to struggle with certain things in live streams, it's okay because it becomes a lesson to everyone else that watches that live stream and later watches that video. But this already is a pretty doggone impressive sew-off sandwich. So we'll do a little bit more stitching and then we'll wrap up this live stream. All right, so I've got this Naga hide left. I've got this Italian leather. I've got this elk hide. I'm almost reluctant to do any more leather, but I'm, I might I might give it a go. I'll try this Naga hide first, and then we'll move into some of these other final sew-offs. And I'm going to try to do two layers of this Naga hide. That might be a mistake, but I'm going to give it a go. Oh, wait a second. I almost made a mistake. I just remember this Naga hide. I need to feed it with same side to same side. In other words, I don't want to put it back to back 
because this is real slippery and I'll have trouble with it feeding, this is going to be a better surface for those feed dogs to grip it and for that uh, presser foot attachment to move it. So I've got to do it like that on this Naga hide. I learned that lesson in another live stream where I was trying to put them back to back and was just having a lot of challenge in getting them to feed uh, evenly and properly. All right, so two layers of Naga hide. Again, uh, I don't know a lot about the history. I know that Emma in one of the recent live streams posted some of the history of this man-made stuff that's made to look like leather. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a tricky, tricky material to sew every time I present it in a live stream because of all the vinyl content in, in here. It's inherently designed to uh, have greater durability, but that also means that it's going to distort the stitch and also potentially cause skip stitching as well. So we'll see how the, I, I, the machine can handle it fine, but we'll see how this, uh, this top stitch needle with our setup is going to be able to manage these two layers of this Naga hide material. And I'll move my arm just as soon as I stitch off a couple little rows here, or a couple little stitches, I should say. All right, here we go. is not an easy sew off you'd think it would be an easy sew off but because of that vinyl content oh my goodness gravy this stuff can be really tricky stuff to sew really really tricky stuff to sew i didn't even look at how long we've been running let me look at the runtime real quick and that'll determine how many more sew offs we do Two hours and 13 minutes. Two hours and 13 minutes. So we'll see if we can do a couple more sew-offs. Yeah, that's some lovely stitching. This is really tricky stuff to sew because of that vinyl. And we just did two layers of it. Look at that from the side as far as the thickness. And yet Marcy's... Uh, 1948, Fister and Rossman handled this very, very nicely. And credit as well to the top stitch needle that apparently does not mind sewing a high vinyl based material because it did a very, very nice job of laying down a beautiful top stitch and a lock stitch. We'll take a look at those uh, right now. And if I set it down, look at how that's curling. You can kind of see what I mean. Kind of see what I mean by that vinyl content in it. Uh, it's really, really has a tendency to, you know, to twist and turn and do everything else it wants to do. All right, let's take a look at this, but I'm pleased with what I'm seeing. So I think our needle is okay for a couple more sew offs, but I'm definitely going to change it out. Let's see if I can get this to stay put here. Maybe like that. Might need a bigger clip. I'm just going to have trouble showing these stitches to you because they keep curling. You know what I mean? They keep trying to curl. Let's see if I can get another clip and do the same thing to the other side. Okay, that's not ideal, but considering I'm working with this vinyl stuff, I'm going to see if I can <clears throat> get it at least level enough that you can see the stitching on it because this is some really really lovely stitching on this tricky um naga hide material okay well, i gotta do one other thing so many things when you're trying to manage camera work and everything else you got to remember to block this and put this there and everything else it's just goofy isn't it hold on a sec All right, I think I got it now. Sort of, kind of got it. All right, almost got it. There we go. All 
All right, the camera has decided to focus in on it, so I better move while I can. But you can see the stitch quality and caliber, uh, even with a tiring needle, a top stitch needle, uh, it laid down some gorgeous, gorgeous top stitching, which considering we're using a top stitch needle, doggone it, it better do it because it's a top stitch needle for goodness sakes. All right, let's go across and take a look. Folks, I'm going to say that that's a page 34 plus stitch. And considering the difficulty of this Naga hide material, incredibly high in vinyl content and uh, really prone to cause uh, skip stitching, distorting of stitching. And as much as this needle is already sewn, including all of that super thick leather, we are getting an absolutely drop dead gorgeous uh, page 34 plus stitch. Just absolutely gorgeous. That's a that's a wow stitch right there. That's a wow wow stitch, just absolutely spectacular. Very very impressed, and I was a little bit hesitant, a little bit concerned about how this needle might handle it. But that top stitch needle did a brilliant job through these two layers of this uh, tricky naga hide material. Let's go ahead and flip it over and look at that lock stitch now. See how that lock stitch turned out. And I'll need both hands to do that with. Do that from the inside, maybe. Okay, let's take a look at this lock stitching now in this Naga High material. Again, we went through we went through two layers of this stuff. Two layers. Waiting for the camera to focus here. We start on this end, see if that works easier for it. This camera is really having trouble focusing on this right now. Let me start it over here and see if we can get it to focus. All right, there it is.
My New Year's resolution is don't drop the camera again. Well, I am struggling with getting the camera to focus on this, but let me just say that it's beautiful lock stitching. It's beautiful top stitching. Um, really, I'm very impressed with how it's managing uh, a very, very, there we go, how it's managing a very difficult uh, sew off. And those of you that can't visualize my setup in the workshop, I've got my one bigger workbench where I've got this Fister and Rossman set up, and then I've got my laptop over my shoulder. I probably should have set it up just left of the machine, but I had the idea that I would have the Bentwood cover sitting there, so I didn't put it out there. But all in all, some beautiful, beautiful stitching. Lock stitch. And also top stitch as well. All right, I'm moving on. <laughs> I'm moving on. Beautiful job on this uh, this tricky Naga hide stuff, though. What a lovely, lovely stitch uh, outcome that this uh, Fister and Roster Rossman just did. Fister and Rossman just did. Really fantastic. All right, back to the pile. It goes. And I'm going to wrap this live stream up pretty quick here. I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick. We might stitch off a couple more things. I probably have to do this bubblegum material, don't I? I'll probably end up doing this bubblegum material. And I, um, I'm i debating if I should try it back to back or if I should try it uh, facing the same way. I'm just feeling the slipperiness of this. And I'm thinking I should probably do it facing the same way like I just did that Naga hide. Let's go ahead and do that. We'll go ahead and do this bubblegum material. The only thing I have left other than that is leather, and I don't know that we're going to do any more leather. I think we push this needle about as far as we can push it. Okay, so bubblegum material, two layers of this. I'll probably clip it together. That way I can sew it maybe a little bit straighter. So I'm just curious. I don't know if any of you have already, I haven't looked at the live chat much, but if any of you have uh, shared any of your new, new Year's resolutions with other folks that are in the live stream, but I'm always curious what people are resolving to do in a new year. So if you haven't shared that yet and you're wanting to do that, share some of your goals for this new year, what you're planning on trying to accomplish or what you're trying, you know, what your goals are going to be in relation to uh, the new year itself. All right, let's give this a go. Bubble gum material. This stuff is a little tricky stuff. Tricky, tricky, tricky. Wow, that's amazing. Beautiful, beautiful stitching. Beautiful stitching. Yeah, we've got a real, actually a real nice balance. I'm kind of surprised because bubblegum material that we just sewed and also that Naga hide are going to have a really high vinyl content. So I would almost be willing to endorse these top stitch needles for being able to manage vinyl based materials very, very nicely. It did an excellent job with the Naga hide, two layers of that. We just sewed two layers of this bubblegum material as well. And it looks like it did an excellent job of managing uh, this bubblegum material also that has a lot of vinyl in it. I'm actually going to hold it like this because I actually seem to get a little bit better presentation of the stitch than trying to get it 
to focus on that uh, stitch off holder before. See if I can get it lined up here. It's probably going to prove me wrong now. It's going to say, uh, no. No, I don't think so. Folks, that's some gorgeous stitching right there. That is some gorgeous, gorgeous stitching on a very, very tricky material. Whenever you have a material that has a lot of vinyl in it, get ready for challenges. More challenges than I faced today in uh, trying to uh, manipulate things with that shuttle. And yet the result is when you persevere, you, you have uh, victory. This is victory. This is what victory looks like right here. angle that camera just a little bit this is what victory looks like i love this this is beautiful i might have sent some of this bubble gum material to sunny i don't remember if i did or not i might have look at it like this too kind of put it in the palm of my hand maybe I think it's better like that. <laughs> yeah, that's some beautiful stitching right there. Beautiful stitching. Let's see what that lock stitch looks like. We're going to turn it over and look at that lock stitch now. Give me just a second here. That's also a beautiful lock stitch as well. You know, I think we found a, a real nice sweet balance right now between uh, the upper tension and the uh, the shuttle down below and certainly managing vinyl. It's liking this a lot, liking this a lot. All right. Um, I almost got it. I almost got it. This is tougher than it looks, <laughs> especially with the laptop kind of behind you. I'm really pleased with this. Uh, after the the, the little battle we had with that shuttle and the thread breaking because I had tightened that band down too far and I was trying to adjust our tension there. Getting that shuttle in the right position and then being able to fine tune it with the upper tension is always the best path to take. And now that we're on that path, we've got a beautiful outcome with this uh, bubblegum material and all the other materials. Let me show you again kind of what we sewed on and off camera. And I did sew cotton on uh, off camera as well. I could stitch some of that real quick. But look at this sew-off sandwich. Lots of leather in there. And again, I don't necessarily recommend that you use a top stitch needle for leather. But you know what? We 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 bumbled through it, didn't we? We bumbled through it, and we got some great outcomes. And then we ventured into some of the other materials, like this uh, bubble gum material and this compressed felt, and this naga hide. And this uh, denim as well. We sewed the denim and all these leathers, goodness gravy, all these leathers that we sewed both on camera and off. And the, you know what? It's a Schmetz needle. Even though it's a top stitch needle, it stood up. It stood up and it, and it persevered along with us. And we got through all of this. So I'm really pleased. 
very, very pleased. Um, hold on one second. going to do one more one more stitch off and then we're going to wrap this up this is how i buy my my cotton for the sew offs and never i don't know if i've ever shown it to you but it's just a basic basic uh fat quarter by waverly and then what i do is i'll use them for different stitch offs uh when i'm showing the the response of the machine to 100 percent cotton material so uh this works for me I don't know if anybody else buys fat quarters and what you use it for, but uh, it gets the job done. It gets the job done. So I'm going to do two sew-offs, I think. Actually, two more sew-offs. And maybe I should just stop while I'm ahead. <laughs> I probably should stop while I'm ahead, but I never do. I'm a full pedal to the metal type guy. All right, so we're going to just stitch two layers of this without stiffener. Just like we're stitching two little panels together. And then we will stitch again with a stiffener in there. And I'm not going to adjust the presser foot pressure. Normally, if I were going to sew something this paper thin, um, I would go ahead and bump that presser foot pressure down. I'm just going to try to muscle through it, and we'll stitch these together. And then we'll do one more stitch off with 100% cotton. Uh, done a ton of leather, other materials. We haven't done a lot of cotton. We haven't done any cotton on camera. So I'll try stitching down this, and then I'll add that stiffener. We'll try one more stitch off, and then we'll wrap this up. And I'm just going to stitch right down the middle. That way, if it wiggles around a little bit, it's not going to go quite as far out of alignment, hopefully. I'll just put two clips on there. All right, 100% cotton, no stiffener. Let's see how the machine uh, manages this. It just turns so easy now. I've got to kind of hold myself back a little bit. So here's a situation where we just did this sew off. And with no stiffener in it, sewing with this tiring uh, top stitch needle, we've got some uh, tension imbalances. We've got some tension imbalances. This is our top stitch, which is, you can see it but it's a little bit underserved. Of course, when you're sewing through something this thin, there's not a lot of space for that not to go, is there? There's not a lot of space for that not to go. It's so thin. It's so paper thin with these two little thin layers of this fat quarter. Then we got our lock stitch on the back, and the lock stitch is a little bit more clear in its definition, a little bit more clear in its definition. But we would have to finagle this a little bit to get a real nice balance. It won't be as much of a challenge when we add that stiffener, because it's going to give a little bit more room for that lock uh, stitch and that knot to find a position. So this is our lock stitch right now. And you probably can't see that very well. Let me see if I can hold it up a little bit. We'll look at the top stitch first, which again is a little bit underdefined. I'm probably going to make an adjustment to that, that top stitch or to that, uh, that upper tension, excuse me. I'll make an adjustment to that upper tension and uh, turn it back a little bit. Because right now it's it's underserved for sure. You can see the the form of it when you look at it from the angle more, but it's underserved for sure with with this super thin uh, sew off. I'm trying to see where I am in the camera. Maybe like that'll be easier. Yeah, 
yeah, it's hard to see. And the camera's having trouble focusing on it as well. But our, our top stitch is not as defined as it needs to be. This is our lock stitch. I'm gonna flip that over. Lock stitch is looking a little bit better defined. Now we're going to take this same material and we're going to add a stiffener to it and I won't make any adjustments necessarily to the tension but because it'll have more space to pull that thread taut top and bottom it should tighten this up quite a bit compared to where it is right now but that's the reality when you're sewing with certain materials and they're super thin it's going to be a little bit harder to get some real clear stitch definition going to be a little bit harder. These scissors are starting to get real dull. I'm getting some real rough cuts on these. All right. All right, that was a lot of effort just to get one little piece of material to sew off. So the same 100% same cotton material, now we're going to try to do it with a stiffener and see what result we get from a standpoint of stitch uh, definition. This was kind of weak, top and bottom. Now we'll see if we can get a little bit more definition out of it. Okay, almost got it. There we go. And again, we stitch in the same material. All we did was add a stiffener to it. We just added a stiffener to give a little bit more depth to the material sew-off we're doing. And right away, the stitching is coming to life. So it's, it's sometimes a matter of the combination of the setup, where your needle is at in the life of itself, and then also how you set up the rest of the machine. This is our top stitch right here, which looked really, really wimpy dimpy before. And now all of a sudden it's starting to come into form uh, very, very nicely. So stiffeners, depending on your setup, depending on, on what you're doing, they can make a world of difference in the stitch quality and the stitch presentation, the glory of the stitch. Same material, 100% cotton. All we did is add a little bit of a stiffener to it. So there's more room for that knot to find its uh, nestle spot. A little bit more room for that knot to find its nestle spot. I'll turn it like this as well. It might be a little bit easier for me. Now you remember the contrast between what we had before 
And what we have now, it's pretty dramatic. It's, it's ridiculously dramatic. Let me grab that other material. I'm battling this. Where's my other material? I'll just use my hand. I'll use my hand for right now. No adjustment to the tension top or bottom. And all of a sudden we go from kind of a mushy a mushy stitch to a beautiful stitch. Let's turn it over and look at the lock stitch. I'm having trouble with the camera. Hold on a second. I'm going to use this manual real quick. Hold on a second. I'll actually use the instruction manual, see if that allows this camera to work a little bit less hard. Well, that's as well as I can do with the camera, but we've got a good looking lock stitch. We've got a good looking top stitch. All of a sudden, by just adding a little bit of stiffener to the two to give a little bit more uh, depth to that stitch line and to where that knot needs the center to give us a good top and bottom stitch, we've got a real good balance uh, between the two. Real nice balance. There's our lock stitch again. And there's our top stitch. We got a little bit more poppiness on the top stitch, but all in all, it's a really, really nice balance uh, as we wrap up this live stream. This has been a little bit of a marathon for us as we've had to overcome a number of obstacles uh, in trying to get the uh, machine set up that I chose to work for us. And uh, feels good. It feels good when you go through a struggle and you finally get to the end and you get a result like this. You get a result like this where you've got a page 34 plus top and lock stitch. And we've done all the other material sew offs on top of that. Both on camera and off. Uh, to running this uh, this Fister and Rossman through the through the paces. We don't see machines like this very often. And it's fun to get them out in front of the camera and run them through a sewing Olympics like this. So I appreciate everybody's patience as we overcame a number of obstacles, but the ultimate result is we hit the finish line uh, victoriously. And other than changing out the needle and maybe rewinding that long bobbin again, doing a better job of it this time, um, this machine is ready to go.
it's ready to go to work and so easy to turn compared to where it started. So I hope all of you have a great, there you go. <laughs> trying to get, trying to get the machine in the shot too. Uh, I hope all of you have a great, uh, a great new year, uh, 2023. Again, I didn't look at the live chat yet, so I don't know what resolutions you've declared, but, uh, uh, I'm excited to uh, to start a new year myself. We always have challenges that we kind of look over our shoulder at, kind of like some of the challenges we overcame in, in this live stream today with this uh, with this machine. But as we look over our shoulder, we can look ahead to a bright future as well, a brand new new year with new opportunities, new live streams, new machines from all over the place. And uh, we can go through those paces together and learn together and learn from each other too. So that's always good, isn't it? All right. Well, happy new year. Happy new year. Happy new year. And uh, thank you again to uh, to the owner of this machine, Marcy. I had to cheat and look at her last name real quick. Uh, Marcy Oslander. Marcy Oslander. And uh, getting a chance to present a machine that we haven't seen on this channel before. Again, back in its heyday from the later 1800s until the very beginning of the 1900s, this was the biggest sewing machine company in Europe. The biggest sewing machine company in Europe, bigger than Foff. And uh, then they faded and they went, they went all the way from Berlin, Germany, eventually being bought by a company where they were then based technically out of London, England. So we've got a German London, England type machine that you've had a chance to catch a glimpse of today. And you've seen us overcome all the challenges and end up with a great outcome. So thanks, everybody. Thanks to the moderators as well. I haven't really followed the live stream at all, so I don't know if we've had any um, porno people that tried to storm us today. But it's always great to have uh, the leaders present, help, helping them to you know make people feel uh, welcome. i got to get a drink. <laughs> helping people to feel welcome and also mitigating things sometimes if we have nasty people that show up like those those robots that are trying to push the porn stuff but uh, yeah obstacles challenges are a part of life even in live streams and it's great when we end up overcoming them and having success so Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. I think it's Saturday. And uh, Happy New Year. Yeah. All right. Boy, that's so far away. <laughs> that's so far away. Oh, let's do it like this instead. That's like a country mile away. Let's try it like this. Almost got it. I can't quite get the hand crank in there. I wanted to get the hand crank in there too. There it is. There it is. Really quite a fabulous machine, isn't it? Quite a fabulous machine. There we go. That's what I was aiming for. All right, I'm going to look at the chat real quick. You all wrap up your conversations. And uh, again, a happy new year to everybody. <laughs> group hug, group hug. Group hug. Oh, and hello to Robin. I didn't even see Robin pop in. I didn't know when Robin joined us, but welcome to Robin as well. And uh, also, hello to her puppy, 
Uh, hello to Robin's puppy, Levi. Levi and uh, Robin received the hat that I sent. I sent out two hats that Susie had made up for me. If you didn't see that, I got to grab them real quick. Hold on, y'all. Along with all the goodies that Susie from Minnesota sent me, she also sent these really cool hats. I've got them wrapped in plastic right now so that they don't get all dusty and dirty down in the workshop. Eventually, I'll find them. There they are. So, one of the last live streams. Let's see. There we go. I think I got it. One of the last live streams, I, I did an unboxing of some goodies that Susie sent and also Bill O'Rourke sent. And it was these really cool hats that Susie from Minnesota had made up. Well, I invited whoever wanted to send me a text message to shoot me a text message with their address, their name, et cetera. And I would mail them one of these. Well, two people stepped forward. One was Robin from Minnesota. Interestingly, these came from Minnesota. And then this, you know, the one that Robin wanted, which I think was this one. Robin wanted this white one with the pink lettering that Susie from uh, Minnesota had made up. And she sent me a really cute uh, picture of herself and, uh, Levi, and then also a picture of Levi wearing the hat as well. But Levi has real pointy ears, uh, real, real pointy ears. And she said, I think, I think it looks better on me. And I agree. And then Steve also got one as well. I, Steve got one that I only had one color of, but these are just fabulous hats that, uh, you know, give folks an opportunity to let other people know in other parts of the country and otherwise know about cow country. And I'm grateful to Susie uh, for uh, making them up for me. They're really kind of cool. Yeah. This black one with the pink lettering is really cool too. I might hang on to that one. So, yeah. So now we've got one of Susie's hats back in Minnesota with Robin and Levi. And the other one is all the way down in Oklahoma with uh, Steve... Uh, Steve Armstrong, I believe his last name is. Steve got that one. So at any rate, I, I digress, but I thought of this, so I wanted to share it with you. All right, everybody, take care. Have a great new year, a great, safe, blessed new year, okay? Take care. Bye. Christine just sent me a text message saying, I, I would like to get one of those hats too. <laughs> oh. I've got some music on. I don't know if you guys can hear it in the background or not, but I've got a little bit of music playing. So. Oh, Susie can't hear the music. I've got it way across the room by the laptop, so I'm not surprised you can't hear it, but it's a little bit of music to jam by, so. If I move it over here. flexible and flip the machine this way. Awkward. It looks awkward, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, exactly. Creative setup. <laughs> I don't know if it's creative or, or scary, but yeah. But I wanted to feature the hats and then the sew-offs. Now I'll move the hats. Now we'll go to setup two and I'll put the sew-offs up there. <laughs> oh my goodness, we have fun, don't we? All right, well, take care. God bless everybody and have a great new year. Have a great, safe new year and a blessed new year.
What's that, Dr. Singer? Oh, we're still live? We're still running? Oh, we are still running, aren't we? Oops. I just wanted to test this elk hide real quick. We always, almost, always, always, always sewed elk hide, right, Dr. Singer? Yeah. And I hadn't sewn this. Oh, wow. Beautiful. And again, this is with a needle that's not designed to do leather. It's not designed to do leather. That's our elk hide right there. Let's see if I can put this book, maybe. The book. The book probably won't help it, will it? Let's see if I've got that lined up or not. Yeah, that's elk hide sewn with a top stitch needle. Hard to see the lock stitch on the back. Really hard to see it, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard to see it. Yeah, so you can push needles. You can push needles to ridiculous lengths sometimes, can't you? You push needles to ridiculous lengths. And now we've learned the lesson that when we're trying to get a better defined top stitch that we don't have to necessarily go down to the shuttle. <laughs> we don't have to go down the shuttle. Yes. All right, I'm done now. And thank you, Dr. Singer, for telling me that the camera was still rolling long after our friends were like, I thought the live stream was over. I thought it was over. Yeah, it is now. So we finally did elk hide as well. Yeah. All right. Go to sleep. Relax. We're done. <laughs> We're done. Yes, Susie's right. You can when it's a schmetz. And Susie gave me so many amazing needles. If you didn't see that live stream unboxing, it's the one just before this one. Check it out. Amazing generosity. And these were some of her favorite things. So, uh, and Christine, I will try to get you a hat in Canada. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Okay. Take care, everybody. God bless. Bye.